preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening and welcome to the third lecture in our series, People and Their Places at the 92nd Street Y. Be sure to catch the last one with Philip Johnson on January 18th. I'm Melissa Golub, Assistant Director of Tours and Travel at the 92nd Street Y, and it's my great pleasure to introduce to you tonight's lecturer, Michael Graves. Michael Graves, a native in Indianapolis, received his architectural training at the University of Cincinnati and Harvard University. Mr. Graves is the Shermer Professor of Architecture at Princeton University, where he has taught since 1962. He is a fellow of the American Institute of Architects and a member of the American Academy of Institute of Arts and Letters. Among his completed projects are the Portland Building, corporate headquarters for Crown American, the Disney Company, Tajima, Kasumi, and Thompson Consumer Electronics the Walt Disney World Swan and Dolphin Hotels in Orlando, and Hotel New York at Euro Disneyland. Mr. Graves has designed numerous cultural and educational facilities, including the Newark Museum in New Jersey, the Historical Center of Industry and Labor in Youngstown, Ohio, the award-winning Emory University Museum of Art and Archaeology in Atlanta, college classroom buildings and laboratories at the University of California in Santa Barbara, the University of Cincinnati, and the University of Virginia. His current projects include the International Finance Corporation headquarters in Washington, D.C., the Federal Courthouse in Trenton, New Jersey, the Delaware River Port Authority headquarters in Camden, New Jersey, office buildings for the Ministry of Culture in The Hague, and the National Museum of Prehistory in Taiwan. Michael Graves is also well known for his design of furniture, furnishings, and artifacts. Among these projects, many of which are marketed under the trademark Graves Designs, are Furniture for Atelier International, Crown, Dunbar, and Architectura, lighting for Baldinger, tabletop items, and decorative accessories for Alessi, Steuben, and Muller. These products are available at the Graves Design Studios stores in Princeton, New Jersey, as well as in retail establishments throughout the United States and abroad. Mr. Graves had received numerous awards for his designs, including 15 Progressive Architecture Awards, nine American Institute of Architects National Honor Awards, and over 50 New Jersey Society of Architects AIA Awards. Um, he will be signing his book, which is outside and available after the lecture. So please join me in welcoming Michael Graves. Thank you, Melissa. That was very nice. Um, I didn't write that. Um, it's such a small crowd. Um, Bill Gates is here tonight talking, um, trying to sell his book. He's so poor. He, should, <laughs> he needs to do that. Um, and I suppose you're all coming to hear Jeff Kipnis interview Philip Johnson sometime in January, I told. I think you'll listen to Jeff Kipnis more than Philip Johnson if I know that pair. Um, I, you know, this is probably a mixed audience. I don't know who you are, whether there are architects here or disgruntled clients or, or happy ones. Um, probably none of the latter. Um, but I'm going to try something tonight, and, and um, you all are going to be the guinea pigs, I guess. But um, this is a, a, a talk about composition and how modern composition carries meaning for us today as against uh, composition and or um, uh, the still life, the idea of the still life, uh, and genre painting carried meaning at another time. Uh, given that I've brought too many pictures, um, and if you don't want to wait for the book signing, which is a surprise to me, um, it's okay, uh, but I understand you had to pay to get in here. Um, shouldn't it be free? Then, then, then we'd have more people, uh, at least some younger architects. Um, so let's start with the first two. I suppose I do that. Forward, forward. I did that. Oh, okay, all right. Um, 
you won't be quizzed later, um, but I will give you some facts about some of this, just so you'll know. Um, on the left is, is a picture you may have seen at some point, but at least you have probably seen the theme. Uh, like an Annunciation, it's probably the, one of the most frequently painted pictures of the, of the early Renaissance. Uh, this is uh, St. Jerome in his study by Antonello da Messina in the 15th century. And um, St. Jerome is shown here um, elevated uh, on this curious platform here uh, inside of this vaulted or arched window uh, and in Flemish painting uh, as Damascena was, though um, from his name you wouldn't think that. Um, it, um, that was a, a regard for, for uh, uh, the idea of, of a liturgical scene. Let me see if I can focus a little bit. Do, 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 do. Maybe it's just fuzzy. I promise I won't do this all night. Oh, maybe I do it there. No. Well, maybe I do it there, Damasina. <laughs> anyway, uh, if you could focus that a tad, uh, well, that would be great. Um, but let me read it for you anyway with tr and try not to spoil it for you. But if you were uh, in the 16th century uh, uh, and and saw this picture, um, you would probably know its theme. Uh, you would know the role that, that St. Jerome um, uh, held and w what he did in the, in the fourth century, though they painted him as though he were, he were a contemporary to that time of Damascenus. Um, and you would then look at the painting to see how the various uh, attributes, how the various symbols were used in the picture. In the foreground on this sill here, for instance, there is a quail and uh, a peacock and a little chalice there. Chalice is, is clear to us to this day, but the peacock uh, in the 16th century had carried a meaning of transcendence, while the, uh, pardon me, the quail, uh, did I say that, the quail transcendence and the peacock uh, longevity. Um, and so they were, in a, in a sense, at odds with each other. In fact, they have their backs to each other, these two birds. Uh, then there is a short rise here on this curious kind of study that has been built inside the church as we see it. We are outside looking in, yet to be cleansed, because um, one, um, uh, St. Jerome has been elevated um, closer to God, they thought. Uh, therefore, they lifted him off the floor to give him a higher station. Um, also, uh, he is there at his study, and his study, uh, his work, his, his um, scholarship has to do with the translation of uh, the Bible into Latin from the several languages that, that uh, he deciphered in the fourth century. Uh, some of the other texts are on the shelves here. We'll talk about shelves a little later. Then we're drawn from the chalice to the cloth here, the holy cloth at that point. Um, but the real point, I suppose, of, of um, St. Jerome is that he was the patron saint of the humanists. So he has some friendship toward us as, as architects and other uh, uh, humanistic studies. Uh, but here he is uh, translating uh, the Bible, but in the corner, and this is something you can't see in Damasena's picture, uh, there is his friendly lion. Like St. Peter had the keys, uh, St. Jerome had the lion. The lion um, approached him while presumably he was in this, all of these are fables, but the, the, in the Syrian desert uh, to contemplate his work that is now taking place here in this picture. Um, the lion approached him, the fiercest of all the beasts. He wasn't afraid. Uh, the lion was limping. Uh, he found in the paw of the lion a thorn. He pulled the, the thorn out, and of course the lion befriended him and became his symbolic protector. Um, the, the, the idea of reading these pictures and understanding the sim, uh, symbolism of the various uh, figures and objects uh, around uh, the, the picture plane uh, continues here. Uh, the window there and the windows back here are off to the city, waiting to be 
uh, uh, redeemed by the, the teachings of the Bible uh, that he is uh, um, now uh, translating. Um, these windows, of course, are literally pointing to the heavens, uh, and no longer can we see the city. We have uh, redemption has occurred, presumably, as we um, uh, elevate our thoughts uh, skyward. Now, though the picture on the right is not of our time, it's a hundred years ago or thereabouts. George Frederick Kiesting, Kirsting in uh, Bavaria uh, painted this simple picture of this wonderful woman sitting at her needlepoint looking uh, at her work and then we see, uh, if you can look at the Biedermeyer mirror here in the side, uh, you see her face reflected in the mirror and it gives us a chance to see this kind of uh, contemplative expression on her face. But unlike the liturgical scene here, seen on the left, we now have uh, this, this simple uh, uh, Bavarian uh, interior shown to us. But if we look more carefully, we see, uh, of course, the wonderful light of the garden uh, illuminating her work and the, the green room in here uh, as a reference, presumably, to the garden. Uh, by Kirsting, the painter, uh, the mandolin or guitar here on the on the daybed or couch, uh, says something to us about what she might do uh, in her uh, uh, after her work is finished. Uh, the I presume family portrait of a recently departed member on the wall because of the garland hanging or draped around it. It would be premature to see that garland before he passes. Uh, but all of that um, in a kind of uh, a domestic scene uh, gives us at least the feeling of the room, the light, the work, uh, and her expression without ever saying, uh, talking about uh, these matters that, that uh, Damasina does on the left. Well, you knew all of that. Let's see if I can do this. Which way do I point these? So this way? Doesn't matter. It did, did seem to matter. Okay. Um, now, uh, in, in terms of other kinds of compositions, let's see something slightly more inert here. Um, but this marvelous uh, second century uh, mosaic floor here, uh, illuminated on the left, um, is uh, from Pompeii. And uh, it's simply called uh, uh, unswept floor at Pompeii. Um, but it's from a kitchen. Um, and I find it quite marvelous that, that uh, in decorating the floor of the kitchen, uh, the mosaicist has elected to be uh, somewhat amusing about it all and has uh, scattered across the floor the leavings of the, the dinner of the night before. And here's the fish bone, as you see there. Uh, well, and then there's the wishbone, which all of you had a few days ago. Um, and other fragments of uh, a fallen dinner, uh, at least to make a smile. But the point of showing you this is that uh, I suppose as the, uh, the mosaicist has, was working across the floor, he or she um, uh, described this and then that and then the next and the next. And they're all about the same distance one from the other simply so we don't miss the point. There's almost a grid of these fragments no matter their size. However, on the right-hand side, at about the same time, the plan of Rome is seen there. And as you see, there are great holes in the plan. Uh, again, it's, it doesn't illuminate very well in, in black and white, but, but uh, there is uh, the circus there and the Colosseum and so on. And what we're um, understanding by the, the relationship of buildings and, and the baths and, and the other uh, state buildings and so on, is that they are accounting for the fall in the land, uh, the, the aspect of orientation, uh, and various other attributes of the site. And therefore, things seem to congeal and make uh, places and fora uh, here and over here, while other uh, pieces of the landscape are left open, um, unlike this kind of evenness that we find there. Now I'll show you why I bring your attention to those two in just Oh, it's going to be one of those. I'm so sorry. 
I know this is right. Um, now, um, in the first century, uh, this wall painting here on the left, we could call it an early still life, though certainly it wasn't named that. Um, and then on the right-hand side, another uh, site, uh, this one uh, not so serious as the one before it. This is in Orlando. Um, for seven hotels that I was asked to uh, prepare a site plan for Disney for uh, new hotels, I ended up building two. And it, I presume that Bob Stern did the rest. Um, he's now a board member, and I'm not. Um, um, but um, on the left-hand side, let's start with this. Here are uh, a series of potatoes in a, a, a wonderful uh, a metal bowl there, a, a, another f a flask, and, and another vessel on this side. And then there are two or three quail meaning something else this time, I presume, uh, simply sustenance for Din Din, uh, which is there on the, hung on the wall. And if you just severed this picture right here, uh, and if I were an art historian, I would read this across for you, A, B, A, with a kind of uh, B prime up here across this center axis. However, I'm not, and you're not, presumably. Um, but on the right-hand side, here's our friend, the the cloth again, this time not holy, uh, but simply the cloth that we all used this past weekend for Thanksgiving. Uh, and then another vessel here leaning up against this kind of plinth-like table. Now there's certain symmetry on the left-hand side and a certain casualness on the right. And if you were asked to look at this and write a paragraph or two about it, you might notice that after a while, that there is a kind of division in this picture. And the way we sort of organize our vision around the most potent part of it. But nevertheless, this more casual part, uh, freer uh, uh, a section on the right-hand side, is also important to identifying what is, what is more, more uh, static on the left. Well, it's that kind of comparison, then, that helps us understand these plants, whether we're walking across the ground plane or looking at it uh, as we, we are here on the right now. Uh, when I started working at, at Disney Orlando, uh, first of all, I should tell you that that's not the whole site. It's much, much larger than this, but, but Walt Disney bought in the 50s um, a, essentially a swamp for very little money, uh, and he then pr uh, proceeded to drain the swamp, and certain areas of it were what um, uh, a geologist might call or land folks call sinkholes, so I'm sure there's a, 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 a better uh, name for it than that, but given uh, Disney's interest in representing all the cultures of the world at Epcot, if you stepped into one of these sinkholes, you would have a quick trip to uh, the other side, which I guess would be the Chinese pavilion um, on the other side of the earth. But I was stuck with with some of these sinkholes. So what I have tried to do in organizing these hotels, these ended up being the dolphin and the swan across that, which I'm not going to talk about tonight. But, but nevertheless, this kind of hemicycle here, which we saw before, was a way of organizing three hotels around that piece of, of uh, that body of water. And this, another hemicycle there um, of a different shape uh, to organize these two primary ones there. And then this more casual one, remember this stuff, over here in a different kind of hotel. So I was starting to portray, given the shape of the water, now I obviously uh, made a geometrical figure out of the first two that I mentioned, um, and located them in a way so they, they seemed to be the kind of new forum. And this time, the forum wasn't someplace you could walk on, but walk around. But I needed to make that contrast uh, uh, understandable to you without, again, uh, Damasina's uh, liturgy. Now, in terms of still lives themselves, uh, I just wanted to say a minute, something about these two for, for just a, a moment. Um, but the, the uh, one on the, on the left is uh, an 18th century picture by a man by the name of uh, Jean-Étienne Lyotard. Um, but it's, it's called Still Life with Figs, and here is this uh, 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 
small piece of bread and, and, and a pear and the rest figs I, back here. And they are on this kind of cloth, or most of them are. You see the drawer here in the foreground. He has signed his name there. Uh, something protruding from the, from the uh, drawer. Uh, and then a kind of errant knife here on the side with three sides to this so that the fruit doesn't presumably roll off or so, something of that nature. And uh, again, think of it for a moment, though this is a reach, as a kind of site plan, if you will, with uh, this panino sitting over here by itself, the knife doing what it's doing in a kind of more dynamic fashion, and then these folks sitting here on the cloth uh, within uh, the boundary of the whole site. Well, um, it's, it's whether something belongs to uh, the rest of the group or is free from it, but how free is it because it's still within the table. And I'm classifying the table there for a moment as, as that top that we see on this sort of small side table in the kitchen. On the right-hand side, <clears throat> uh, a modern, well, I'd say modern, uh, still life by uh, Giorgio Morandi. Um, where in the 40s, Mirandi explored these issues of light and the source of light in his studio um, in Bologna, uh, where he illuminated the vessel here and here behind uh, this figure there. And if, again, like uh, the picture before on the left, if we saw the symmetry of this centerpiece here and then the asymmetry caused by uh, the kind of errant vessel to the right, uh, we start to see how we as a society, without reading the liturgy, start to uh, regard uh, the placement of these elements. Think about the way uh, we uh, all set the table for uh, Thanksgiving dinner, uh, how we classified the various people or friends or relatives around the, the table, and how you put some people next to other people, and we all know why we do that. Uh, and why, why that sometimes works and why sometimes it doesn't work, uh, and the kinds of, of, of plates and dishes, uh, glasses, uh, flatware, and so on that we use uh, depending on, on uh, the various foods that we're, we're uh, uh, consuming. All of that is very calculated uh, kind of a series of events and rituals that we go through uh, almost without thinking, except when something's done badly or wrong, uh, you think about how it could have been. Um, on the left-hand side, we saw a moment ago, uh, let me parenthetically say a moment ago, in the, in the Kirsting we saw a little uh, a mandolin or a guitar. Uh, now again, that, that figure uh, comes up in still life over and over again. On the right-hand side, any Cubist uh, worth his or her salt would use uh, the, the, that uh, stringed instrument uh, to represent the female figure. Here's our friend uh, Mac the Knife again uh, opening the drawer this time. Gri, Brock, Picasso all use these motifs to, to portray male, female, the, the table itself, the way we open the painting literally uh, open the painting to the other side in cubism and purism and so on. On the left hand side, however, the meaning is somewhat different. Um, in uh, Baskinus's uh, uh, 17th century uh, Flemish picture here, um, I'll have to sh read it for you because it's not uh, uh, very well reproduced, but this is the end of a piano. There are the legs of the piano and uh, then a table in front of the piano. Here's, here's another open drawer with some of the music spilling out. Uh, another uh, folder here with music uh, then uh, emerging from it. And you see uh, several instruments all turned over on the top of the piano as if the musicians have just left uh, the room. And presumably they have. And we are to think about the music uh, that has just been played, and if you think about some of those Flemish rooms that Vermeer and others painted, wonderful light usually coming in one window, uh, but they were very closed, and there were many interior rooms. And if you think about what the, uh, not only domestic life, but the hygienic life was like in some of those uh, rooms, I find it quite amusing that one of the reasons these musical um, still lives were painted is that they thought that the sweeter the music, 
that the foul odors of those rooms would be carried out into the street where it didn't matter uh, by the, the sound waves of the sweet music. So these are meanings that pictures like this carried uh, at that time, which we know really nothing about today. But nevertheless, I at least find fascinating. Um, now, if there are, and I know there are a couple of architects in the audience, most of you, if you're my age, um, were brought up on this little picture here on the left, which was drawn by Le Corbusier in 1910. It's called the Maison Domino, and it's really one way to think of the, the beginning of modern architecture, though it literally is not. Uh, but Le Corbusier is describing here in this curious little diagrammatic drawing uh, a series of floors or floor slabs here, just horizontal planes in space, supported by uh, terribly thin columns, as you see here. These are not columns of the orders. These are not classical columns. These are, in fact, steel reinforced concrete columns. And he can do this, he, he can make a diagram like this uh, as a, a didactic kind of statement because what he is saying here is that with modern technology, uh, one is able to support the floors, unlike this building that we're in now, where I presume the walls uh, are supporting uh, the outer edges of this building and, and not the columns as you see here, or any traditional building. And he was happy to always describe the Maison Domino, obviously named after the kind of domino slabs uh, of the game, uh, against the more traditional uh, middle class house, suburban house, supporting the, the, the walls, keeping the, keeping the surfaces intact. The integrity of those uh, surfaces had to be uh, intact to keep uh, the support idea going. And so the windows had to be smaller. But here, he showed us how we could make a new city out of glass. And we, we built it and up to uh, quite recently. The French did not, as he was Swiss French. Um, but nevertheless, I show you the Maison Domino here as Le Corbusier describes the free plan. Now, he can make any plan in here he wants, he says, because he has now supported the floors uh, by other means. On the right-hand side, another little leap for you, uh, here are my slabs, uh, shelves of a, another still life. Uh, uh, and this is um, a still life that, that um, was painted in the 16th century, a Flemish school picture. And again, it's from the kitchen. And you see all of these oils and so on uh, here on the shelves. It looks a bit like the mess in my kitchen after this past weekend. Um, but you also see a snuffed out candle. And it doesn't take a genius to figure out that, that that's, in a way, like the quail before of the uh, uh, Damascena picture, where that snuffed out candle has to do with not just the veritas of the plenty of all of this, but the opposite in, in the idea of, 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 of uh, evil and death, as does this mouse over here, if you can see that mouse, who's having a little feast on the bread. and. And he's representing evil as well as sustenance is represented on one side, the evil is represented on the other. He's kind of decomposing that bread, another kind of evil, I suppose we could think of decomposition. But here is, in this kitchen scene, my free plan, if you will, on these rather standard slabs or shelves that we all make and compose. And for this Flemish painter, uh, a way of providing some meaning for uh, us to, in, in terms of reading um, that, uh, that composition. Um, yet another reach. Uh, another picture that many of us were, and building that many of us were brought up on in school, was the one on the left, the Salvation Army uh, building in uh, Paris by Le Corbusier in the 20s. Um, and what one finds in this rather curious site, this street is, is uh, from uh, close to the building there, moving out away from it. It's not parallel to the facade of the building, which is parallel to the street behind. But what Le Corbusier has done in this particular building is to make a kind of standard housing slab for all those folks who were going to use the Salvation Army at night to sleep there. And then a series of pavilions, there are actually three, the third one doesn't show so well here, 
uh, three pavilions in the foreground uh, and what he hopes will happen from the first to the second to the third and finally into the big slab of Maison Domino behind it um, is that a certain ritual and cleansing goes on. You're told where to get your clothes and where to, where to shower and, and uh, where you are fed. All of that in the kind of stages to the cross, as it were, uh, as you work your way through these, these objects in the foreground. Now, if you look at Le Corbusier's painting on the right, you can see that, that these vessels, as these vessels of space, are not dissimilar one from the other, and that the, the ground plane or the picture plane here with the sky behind it is almost as if his easel, and here's his easel, has been turned up, not unlike that big slab behind. And Le Corbusier is composing like a painter and filling out the rest of this site. Um, and I could show you the site plan for that. We're almost finished with 101 here. Um, but there is the site, uh, there's the slab behind that you just saw. The, the street is moving this way, and one walks in here, and then in here, and then into the third object. And actually, uh, with the pochet around this, there's thought by some to be a fourth as you enter uh, the, the, uh, the big housing block behind. Now, if you think about the, uh, the separation of the slab from the objects in the foreground, it's a little different, and Le Corbusier was many things um, as a painter, as an architect. But on the right-hand side, a Swiss architectural historian uh, once uh, made a, a, a drawing to superimpose the three levels of the villa at Garche, a, a small town, a vacation town outside of Paris, where he built a house for, the, uh, for Gertrude Stein's family, her cousin, actually. Uh, and here it is there and then the free plan you see these kinds of objects not unlike these objects and we could see the kind of cubist or purist guitars and so on um, then identifying that space but what the what the drawing shows is a transparent um, um, layering of all of those floors as if we could see through them and you see the the painter at work again in the transparency of memory as one goes in the first floor, obviously to the second, to the third, and back through uh, the whole organization of the house. And what Le Corbusier wanted you to do, presumably, was like a good novel, I suppose, remember and project uh, within the frame of that space what was about to come in terms of the narrative of, of uh, this passage through this house. Now, let me take the slide on the right first. Le Corbusier also <clears throat> um, was a student of history, and um, there uh, was a, 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 another uh, architect in the 16th century, uh, uh, Pierre Ligorio, uh, who, who had drawn the city of Rome from its ruins and projected on the ruins the buildings he thought would have been there. Obviously, some weren't in doubt, like the Colosseum, but many of them were just uh, this, this kind of scavi of the city. And from the size of the foundations and so on, uh, Pierre Ligorio and a few other uh, scholar architects uh, devised ways of uh, determining what they thought um, the buildings might be like. And, and uh, Ligorio has many, many drawings of those projections, but <clears throat> uh, this is almost one of them, but this is a drawing by Le Corbusier of Pierre Ligorio's drawing of Rome. It's not Rome, uh, things are in the wrong place, but they're almost right. But what Le Corbusier does as an architect is, is from those shapes say, well, in a curious way, our cities, whether Rome or New York or, 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 uh, or Paris, are made up of these kinds of figures that you can see registered across the, the top, which Le Corbusier has drawn, not Piero Ligorio. And it is those kinds of vessels of space, whether you group them, uh, whether you uh, compose them as you saw in that second century plan of Rome, or uh, in the, 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 the Corbusier version of Piero Ligorio on the right, it's simply, in a way, a recomposition of those several figures. And so I show you um, here on the left 
a project done a, a few years ago. It's not current, but I just wanted to use it tonight because there are a series of cubes on this side, the small cylinder <coughs> there in La Jolla, California, which is a health club. In Southern California, you've got to have a health club. Um, then um, a, a, an office building, which is compiled of uh, three different shapes, which allows the, them to rent uh, ver different floor plates to, uh, in this speculative building, and then a kind of standard uh, three uh, pavilion slab there for a Hyatt hotel. But they are composed around the pool, around the view, uh, and around a courtyard for the restaurants here on the side, in a way that that one imagines using in these uh, in these kinds of compositions those those elements to. Uh, recompose the city, even though it's not in the city. This, uh, I've brought too many pictures tonight, so some of these I'm going to go rather quickly. These are the restaurants. They have their own character. I mean, the next, it's not just composition. Uh, this is a Western restaurant. This, if it were a better slide, you would see a kind of grid across the face of that uh, Japanese restaurant on the side. Um, and then uh, the whole composition there on the right again. Um, the entrance into the health club here on the left and then from the hotel on the right to the health club which is standing here just at the side of all of this. The awning helping us to uh, portray the character of, of that building while not uh, uh, diminishing the importance of the running track inside. Inside the a kind of uh, two different lobbies, one simply a passage through and the other a kind of lounge here on the left. Uh, much of the furnishing, except for the Hoffman furniture here in the foreground, we've, we've done here, the, the carpet, the lighting, uh, lighting, uh, other pieces of furniture and, and so on. As we will see, I haven't, I'm not showing you any of the products tonight except within the interiors. Um, Another project that we're doing in California, <clears throat> though since the, uh, um, the recession, this has been on the shelf, though we're given to understand that they have a tenant for this first one. Three million square feet, much too much, obviously, uh, but the kind of 80s size of things. An office building here, two more there, uh, a big hotel there. This, the convention center is just over here to the side, uh, and then there's a retail uh, 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 building on the backside with a courtyard in between all of this. I show you this because architects today, as we <clears throat> I build vertically, uh, very different proposition in, in terms of the compositions that we use as against, let's say, a Renaissance architect like Piero Ligorio, where the city was horizontal and probably a lot better because of it. But here we are building vertically, and so what I tend to try to do is to pull out from the program of each of the buildings those things that are as different as I can find, uh, the retail at the base, uh, the meeting rooms uh, in the body of the building, the, the uh, guest rooms up above with some with balconies, uh, and then again California, the ever-present health club at the top of uh, the building. Uh, you can't be too fit or have too many sunglasses uh, in Southern California. On the right-hand side, uh, this table here, uh, like the several tables, if you will, of the horizontal planes of the Maison Domino now revisited, <coughs> um, are seen on the right. Again, um, a first century picture. Uh, and this one is, is a wonderful one in that you see the waves here at the base, therefore you know it's a funerary picture. Um, this table is on its way uh, with the recently deceased. The, the uh, pomegranate is here, uh, and that um, will indicate the, the, the uh, sustaining of life because if you open the inside, of course, the red gets all over everything, but it's the kind of symbolic blood. And then the three vessels up above, Here's our, here are our friends ABA again. Uh, but, but you start to see the levels of the table and even the ground plane here, and our ground plane is literally green there. <coughs> um, and uh, it, is, it is that kind of recall for me, a way of signifying in the vertical surface 
what is then held behind in buildings that are as complex and, as, and at the same time as simple in program as, as modern office buildings and hotels. Um, I can't tell, because I'm at such an angle, whether that projects on the right or not. But um, we have been working, our office has been working in Japan for about 15 years. And so I'm going to show you some Japanese projects that are, are always curious on their own terms because of their siding generally and their materials. But um, this one is a, is a small office building in a place called Skuba, um, which is a new town in Japan, founded around a new university. And, and some of you know the work of Arata Isasaki, Isasaki's first major building uh, in Japan, his home. Uh, was in Scuba. It was a big town center. Uh, some of you might remember it. But I was hired after the clients had fired their architect, which doesn't often happen in Japan. People have life tenure for everything, it seems, except this particular architect who had somehow upset the client. But the client did ask me if I could save the footprint. They would save a year uh, in approval, the approval process. And so here is the footprint of this curious building here that the former architect had made. But I was allowed to reorganize everything in that footprint, and I did. Um, the office building is seen here in the center, and then these two figures on either side, the kind of saddlebags of the, of the building. Oh, you're a savior. Ah, you probably don't want me to talk anymore. Um, and then the porte cochere here in the foreground was something that the clients wanted to, in a sense, give back to the city, a small gallery for local artists uh, that would be scheduled over the year, and they would have these uh, uh, month-long shows, and, and people would arrive, and, and so it provided a kind of front door. It gave, the, as a symbol, the, the, the center to the composition, but it also made the arts in scuba almost more important than, than the lecture halls and the tea and lunch ceremonies over here on the side. But from the standard office building, which is in the center, what I've done is pull out the, those things that are the kind of adjectives of it all and to give it emphasis and to give it a, a, a sense of, of itself on the site. And here it is in its site, built of tile. The Japanese love tile because it's somehow thought of as hygienic in a, in a place where the, the, um, the acid rain needs to be washed down on the face of the buildings periodically. Um, and so since there is no natural stone in, in uh, Japan, there on, there's only ro quarried rock uh, that you know, of course, from the temple bases. Um, but here is this tile building, which I'm rather uh, happy with. In, in fact, it gave me a chance to see the differences um, not only in, in color, uh, of course, but uh, as I said before, in the form of each of them. Details of that, that tile work that you see here. I don't generally take pictures like that. That was taken by some professional photographer. Also in Japan, in a city that uh, we're now completing our third building in, uh, Fukuoka, um, uh, a new hotel for Hyatt. 250 rooms in this rotunda. This is my model here, a uh, copper clad uh, series of columns for the balconies outside. There's actually two floors in each one of these again, so half the floors get balconies and gives them a rent schedule which they like. There are two arms that reach out here, here, and here where one finds the suites and then uh, at the base uh, restaurants. Uh, the taxi or bus pulls up here under the porte cochere, drops people off, they register and, and uh, either spend the night or move back in the back of the building, which is a, uh, an office building, top lit here, and then beyond the office building is yet another hall, which looks out to a, a kind of working river on the back side of the, of, of the building. That hall at the back, which is a kind of conference hall, um, and ballroom is used as much for wedding receptions as anything else. In fact, the wedding became a big part of the program of this Hyatt Hotel. You can imagine how much booze they sell. So 
it became very important. Um, but here is the, the front of the building from the park across the street before it was landscaped. Um, and then the, the port cochere, as you see there, and you can see here the single column where the taxi, well, actually the taxis go backwards, so uh, they go around the other way. They drive on the wrong side in Japan, um, or what we think might think is the wrong side. And then copper up above here uh, to lighten all of that and to uh, uh, be a little uh, more clever about the way it gets together with its context uh, of buildings adjacent to that. Um, inside, the center of the rotunda gives over to the hallways leading to the guest rooms. Um, and here's that uh, double story arcade inside. Um, and then meeting rooms on this uh, third floor, the ground or, or lobby floor down there. And then a, a kind of smaller replica of this is seen as the stair tower that takes you <clears throat> from the ground floor up to uh, the mezzanine level for that wedding reception. And yes, the bride and groom get their pictures taken right there in this gold leaf stair. This is a big hit, evidently. Um, inside the rotunda uh, of, the, of the lobby, uh, there is a pyramid here um, that doesn't uh, show very well. All sides seem to be equal, but um, that's what it looks like from the outside, which is this kind of mountain peak, which is a replica of those mountains that surround Fukuoka. And then that, of course, uh, those rooms there, or not rooms, but the corridor <coughs> above the uh, the base of all of this, look back to the mountain as you uh, gain access to the real light outside, uh, enter your room, and then look beyond that to the mountain on the other side of uh, the building. The interior of all of this is, is maple wood, um, so it's rather pretty. Um, in um, uh, Chiba, which is a, another n newly invented town, which grew to about uh, th three or four million people in about 20 minutes. Um, it's the city that you see on the way from Narita to, um, to Tokyo and that dreadful drive that we all take, those of us who go to Japan. Um, but this is a, a, a wonderful m mixture of uses uh, with uh, shopping in an arcade here. You can just see it around this hemicycle there. Facade, which looks out there, which uh, retail shops there. And then behind it, um, a building that was once going to be occupied by Bloomingdale's, but is not now. Uh, above that, offices and apartments. So you get all of that, uh, different elevators and so on for those uh, various events. We won a competition. Uh, and this, but this has not been built yet, uh, waiting for the banks. Uh, but that happens to all of us. Um, another building in Fukuoka, a small housing block, this was really the first one we built in Fukuoka, um, retail at the, at the base, one of those banks. Um, and then four floors of housing above that with the living rooms here in this little octagon at the corner. Um, this is um, the borrowing of land, as it, as it were. This is sort of the end of Fukuoka, and then they did an infill of a whole new city beyond there. And at the end of this axis, which is about a half a mile long here, we're now building this housing tower, which is right smack dab there uh, at the end of that, that phase. And that tower then has two different kinds of apartments in it. It's fully rented, though it's not even finished, and it looks out to the Fukuoka Bay. But you see the horizontal striping again as the difference in program start to take effect in the building as it does here on the left in a speculative office building in <coughs> Osaka where the client wanted various kinds of floors uh, to rent, some with balconies, some with not, some with one kind of window and the other. And so it was easy to, for me, I enjoyed kind of making a kind of palazzo in front of the facade and, and then seeing that as the ground behind, thinking again of that painting by Le Corbusier, though one doesn't literally think of it in that way. This is architecture about architecture rather than the, the uh, Korean consulate, which is this box that it came in uh, there on the left. Um, then on the right-hand side, uh, another speculative office building 
again with different kinds of floors, rentable floors in Tokyo, not yet built. If you think of, of um, <laughs> Joseph Cornell's upside down picture here on the left, but you're not close enough as I am to see, think of gravity as standing on your head for a moment. But Cornell, uh, very aware of our, uh, the commonplace in what we do, not only in his objects, but also in the kind of grids that he placed those very special objects within. And we think of ourselves as rather special as we look at a, at a the kind of uh, buildings that many of us occupy or many of you occupy and the, and the, the kind of sea of windows in a city like New York. Um, where is your window, Daddy? Uh, it's up there in the middle. Um, but in this little office building, again in, in Tokyo, for a tile company that I've worked for for about 10 years, designing tiles for them, they finally asked me to, <clears throat> to do their corporate headquarters on the Kanda River, another working river, a rather pretty little working river on the other side of, of this drawing. Um, but what I did was try to use not only the tiles, but also the blue and white of, of the idea of reflection on a, on a surface of a building next to a, a river, but try to give differences to the facade as Cornell tries to, to uh, give differences by virtue of the objects within, where you cannot see the objects now or us within that uh, making something more of the front door, the exhibition gallery of, of tiles that they have in the building, uh, the corporate headquarters there, and the lunch rooms at the top, again using uh, themes of water uh, with a, a kind of strong debt to, to uh, uh, folks in, in uh, uh, Austria at the turn of the century, uh, where where the blue and white checkerboard here is like, if it were a better day, like the kind of reflection that you would get up on the face of the building as it does here on the side and the pergola at the top for us to have our green tea out there uh, on a summer's day. In um, Yokohama, um, I built this tower a few years ago. Uh, it has we have yet to uh, design the interior of the base, which was meant to be an art school, uh, but they haven't come up with the dough to make the, the architecture, but to run the school. So it stands here as two kinds of apartments, and then a third, uh, the penthouses up above. I've had an agent in Japan for all these years that I've been working there, and he's taken this apartment, so something's happening right for him. but. But uh, we hope to get to do the interior of what that one of these days. And then an office building outside of, of Osaka on the right-hand side, which is uh, mostly office, but a little housing at the top. In a wonderful fishing village in, uh, just south of Tokyo on the, on the bay, um, a place called Unjuku, uh, we built a city hall. Here is the city hall. Uh, this is the uh, uh, essentially a small hospital, a health facility, uh, then a library, a, a kind of political library for the city hall and meeting rooms. And then a tower, which is here. And you see the city hall has no city around it. Uh, it's actually, you, that's way, way down in the rice paddies below. But they built the city hall up on a hill overlooking the town. You can imagine how that would go down in the United States. But, but anyway, the point of all of this was symbolic, that this tower, which is a stair tower on the side of the building, which is like this tower, but made more of it, is an observation platform to look out over the bay because of the history of this town, which is curiously wonderful. Uh, in the, at, at the turn of the century, um, a Spanish um, uh, boat capsized in a, in a storm off of Anjuku. Uh, the men folk were presumably out fishing uh, as the storm came up quickly. Uh, the women who were clamorous and evidently quite girthy 
um, because they swam in the water without wetsuits and all of that in those days. Uh, but that extra layer kept them warm in the winter in the water, uh, evidently when some fish was, was to be had. But they swam out and saved all these Spaniards and now it's a, a very wonderful mixture of Japanese and Spanish people in, in and, and evidently they saved them and warmed them by big bear hugs and so on. This is how uh, it, the story is told. In fact, there's this wonderful bronze sculpture in town of one of these uh, uh, figures um, with the Spaniard. But anyway, this tower is to see the next uh, vessel who might lose its way or, or, or shipwreck outside of Onjuku. No telling what the next mixture will be. <clears throat> in um, uh, Taiwan, uh, we are uh, building in the south of the island in a, a small town called Taitung, a uh, history museum. Um, actually, they call it the Museum of Prehistory, which I haven't quite figured out yet. Um, but uh, this is the site plan uh, for the building entrance here. Um, big courtyard, performance court there, series of buildings around the periphery, uh, and then housing over here for scholars who are involved in a dig, which are, is on this side of a railroad that's, that separates the site from the dig. Uh, not our choosing, but that's the way it is. The museum here, uh, office there, which has now changed quite a bit, the refectory and library for the scholars there, and then their housing. We have, uh, in the original scheme, this competition scheme, which we won, um, and the working drawings for this are now being done in, in Taipei. Uh, this is uh, 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 changed quite a bit, but originally uh, we used uh, the kind of aboriginal uh, building types of that region as, as various uh, migratory groups moved across Taiwan uh, from uh, east to west, uh, generally. They left their artifacts, they left their architecture and continued to move on. And, and their architecture, uh, when there in Taitung, was built of slate oftentimes, uh, and, and they just laid it up horizontally, big slabs of slate, uh, without mortar. Um, and so these wonderful walls were built of slate, uh, very few windows, uh, in the surface of all of that, and then the rest of this would be uh, generally uh, out of, of um, hemp and, and various um, straw kinds of material, um, thatch and so on, but we've made that out of copper because of the codes, laws, and so on, but um, again, an, an ephemeral, malleable material like uh, the, 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 that that they used. None of these mock their buildings, but it uses their traditions with a, a kind of wooden base here where we needed uh, to let light in at the base of, of these exhibition galleries. Uh, this is one of the housing uh, pieces stabilizing these, these um, uh, slate walls with small openings for the windows for the various scholars, and then a restaurant on the right, again with an observation tower looking back <coughs> at the dig. Uh, at the top of the building. Now moving slightly uh, westward of uh, Taiwan, uh, we come to mainland China. I don't know whether I can focus that for you. Left focus. Oh. That's a little better. Um, a competition um, which uh, we didn't win, uh, but it seems that nobody really won, but uh, two of us were awarded two buildings apiece out of nine. And they'll start with my two and somebody else's two, uh, uh, Chinese architects too. But th this is a main drag in, in um, a city uh, called Xiamen, uh, about an hour north of, of Hong Kong by plane. And there are nine buildings uh, here and here with a retail base, and uh, there are our buildings around a man-made lake that's now under construction there. Um, it's not quite clear who will get to do their master plan in this competition, as things are a little murky, uh, as they're still trying to get the, the uh, infrastructure to many of these sites. Um, but our buildings 
uh, not taking the colors from the Forbidden City, but when the Chinese see this, they are amused um, because they are building a sort of uh, Third Avenue as fast as they can in Shanghai and Beijing. Uh, and then they remember the Forbidden City, but it takes somebody like me, I suppose, going to see a place like that in the world and being so captivated by the color, and then modern architecture has made everything, uh, has made everything antiseptic and white. These white refrigerators out in the rain are very curious in a, in a situation like, like that, given the, the traditions that they have. But this, is a, this will never be built quite like that, but they haven't even told me which two I get to do. Um, <clears throat> another competition, this is for the telecommunications building of, of Xiamen, same town, um, uh, 72 stories, much too tall. Again, waiting for the infrastructure, but again, like the tables that I showed you from my beginning, not a beginning sketch, a, a, a late sketch, and then the model, you start to see the differences in the kinds of offices that we could provide. Uh, from lunch rooms to the offices to places for break and, and so on. Anything that's different in the, in the kind of mundane plan we, we kind of uh, uh, capture in the, in the, in the scheme. <clears throat> Back in the United States, uh, uh, this is a, a, a place called Thompson Consumer Electronics in Indianapolis. Uh, Thompson owns RCA and GE Consumer Electronics. GE's on one side and RCA's on the other side. It was originally an American company, but it's now French. You didn't know that. Um, I didn't either, even though I'm from Indianapolis. But this is their corporate headquarters in the United States. Um, and um, I, I, I don't know why, but this was the third time that this had happened to me. They had fired their architect. Uh, they called me and said, would I work on this building? And we talked. But it was their third architect, so I was worried uh, that I might be the fourth. But since I'm from that town originally, and they only asked me to do the interior, it didn't look like this, by the way. It was, it was something like you would see on Route 1 on the way to Princeton. Uh, it, had, it was gray with maroon racing stripes, as I remember. And they asked me if I would do the interior of the what they called the atrium building. And there was this lump that was planned for the middle. And I said no. And they said why. And I said, well, my sixth grade algebra teacher would come to see what all the shouting's about. And, and she would be disappointed and think I did the whole building. So they said, well, what if you did the whole interior for the whole building? And I said no, same, same response. <clears throat> so then they said, well, what about just doing that. Since all of this was built in steel, and the Maison Domino was very much in evidence there, though the cladding wasn't on, the stairs had been determined, everything had been determined in the plan, and I said no again. And, and I said, but listen, I've got a, a real bargain for you. I, this was something that was not only fast-tracked, and that's just jargon for architects and builders, uh, but it was also design-build. So there was uh, the budget was fixed, the time was fixed, and most of the materials had already been, as they say, bought out. So I had to work with all of the people who were already making things, uh, though some of them hadn't started. So I said, if I can stay on the same schedule and not spend a penny more, can I just do the whole thing? And they said, of course, but you can't do that. And I said, I bet you. Um, so we did, and they're happy, and we're doing more work for them now. Uh, but. But uh, I had a hard time with strip windows. I always have a hard time with strip windows uh, like this. And so I'm, in a way, talking against the kind of thing that, that I'm actually for. Um, but, but I tried to break it up, at least visually, by this curious checkerboard, which always reminds me of when I go back to uh, Indiana or fly over the Midwest and see all of those farms divided up into precise one mile by one mile squares all over the state, uh, it reminds me of that kind of pattern, that relentless pattern. Um, and then, since I used to, to date the girl who lived on this site, um, Jeannie Sage, I think her name was, um, and she, her father had a wonderful red barn. Um, I just made this big barn, which was once standing on that site. And then, of course, on dedication day, they said, well then, if that's, 
if this, these are the farms and that's the sage barn, what's all this yellow about? And um, so by now you should be able to say what you all should be able to say what that yellow is about. And if you can't, there is the light that we all drew as first graders uh, in the big yellow sun as it came in the, in the roof. And here is my oculus at the top of that rotunda inside that red barn, which is a stair that takes you up the four floors. Uh, Nipper is kind of out of scale there. Um, but um, I thought it would be wonderful if I could hide the stairs as much as possible. So I, I did that in terms of the decoration of, of it all uh, to get all these folks from GE and RCA to talk to each other and to move across uh, these four floors through this kind of stair mixer in the, in the center of the plan. Oh, we're, we're leaving home again, I'm sorry. Um, this is a, a new commission, <clears throat> not under construction yet, but will be very shortly, as it's all going to be made out of handmade bricks and mud in a place called Elguna, which is on the Red Sea in Egypt. Um, th this client owns two hotels next door. Here, a hotel that looks like Motel 6, and the one uh, next to it, which looks like uh, what's his name? Tom Baudet, who leaves the light on for you. Um, I mean, and these are places that cost a lot of money, and they're very plain Jane, and they look out to this wonderful body of water, and you sit <clears throat> on this sand, and every day is glorious. Uh, but there's very little that grows there. Um, and there would be very little for any of you to go there except for the Red Sea. So. I thought it would be interesting if, one, we could landscape it by bringing the water in, and they thought that was a fine idea. And since, since it's almost free as you're building all of this, uh, and as, as uh, the backhoes are in there anyway to make these shallow pools that, that irrigate all of that, and maybe something will grow. Um, but the point was just to make more water and pools and so on that that would encourage us to go there and to have uh, a more temperate kind of place to swim and paddle around if you're a child. But also to build uh, these things in the traditional manner. And that means to build out of thick walls uh, uh, with uh, a, a wonderful uh, brick that they make from the sand. Uh, and then they, they parge it and paint it. Uh, and it's really quite glorious. And he was, my client was, uh, worried that I wasn't doing what he had hired me to do, which is to make what he thought was going to be a Michael Graves building. And I said, what this, what this is. And uh, all my friends will come here, and they'll all want to buy rooms, not just rent them, if we, if we do this. And, and nearby, there was a new town that was starting, and it was using this traditional construction, so I could show him that. And then, of course, I won the, the day when I told him it would be cheaper. Um, and it is by, by half. But these are drawings of, of the buildings as they're developing, not the one on the right. That, that's too uh, plain Jane, but it, it was a, a suggestion of, of this one here. Uh, but they're, these are just character studies of the site. Uh, we need to do more work. And staying away uh, from the United States for a minute longer, um, in Europe uh, this time, um, in Antwerp, we're building a new hotel, again for Hyatt, though we brought them in this time. Uh, there is the train station at one end of the second largest square in Antwerp, um, called the Astrid Square or Astrid Plaza. Astrid was a queen of the 40s, 1940s. Um, and there was always this broken tooth at the end of the site here with the, the Bahnhof or the, the train station down here. The zoo is off there to the left. Um, and you see this enormous turn of the century Bozar building there and with its symmetry uh, and it's registered across the face of the square and then uh, okay buildings along the side, not the, not the best in the world but certainly not the worst. And then our building at the other end which has to look back at the train station and also be compatible to the smaller elements on the side. And um, the site is a little bit asymmetrical. The, the street is much wider, and you take a little a side street down here. So 
uh, what we've done is, is made symmetry around their existing square in the, in the center and back to the face of the train station, and then added our casual piece here on the side, though that's gotten much better. This again was a competition, which we won, and is, I suppose, three quarters finished this building. Now it's taking forever. This, like the ship in Nanjuku, this happens to be not a Flemish uh, ship, but a Portuguese one of the 18th century. Uh, but these are the kind of boats that came into uh, Antwerp in a navigable river called the, the Skelt, um, like Philadelphia, I suppose, in, in uh, Delaware. And um, uh, so the, the port is secured, uh, and this is the old port just to the side here, and our our, our building then uses the kind of history of the port as decoration uh, and naming and so on um, as a piece of sculpture on the facade. And I'll show you from traditional Antwerp why that seems to be appropriate. This is the primary Grut Square uh, in Antwerp. And there's the sculpture on almost all of these Gothic and Renaissance buildings that surround the Grutten Square. And there's their kind of uh, city symbol who's a figure for, like David and Goliath, except this is a little more gruesome. Uh, this is uh, Goliath's hand, so you can figure out the rest. Uh, but sculpture and building sculpture is rampant in that city, and so it seemed appropriate in, uh, as this is now going to be a trellis in front of the restaurant, which they'll grow stuff on, and I hope takes the shape of that ship that you saw. Though they may chicken out at the end. Um, in um, The Hague, um, which is the capital of Holland, um, and I say that because this is the Ministry of Culture in The Hague that we're doing. In a, in a quarter of, of The Hague, it's not a quarter of the city, but one, one portion of the city that has been replanned by, by uh, uh, Rob Creer. And uh, the clients have not only invited Rob, but a number of other architects. The American, the other American is, is Caesar Pelli, who's building a building right here in this plan. Our building uh, is here, uh, a, a Dutch architect here on the side, the other half of the Ministry of Culture, an Italian architect here, and then other Dutch architects around uh, there with uh, another building by Rob Creer, and I'll, I'll show you in a moment. But when I first went to the Hague to look at this site, I was just captivated by buildings like this of the 18th, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, where the windows are enormous. They're like these windows or French doors here on the side of this room. But in a, in a curious way, they're not like a window wall of, of modern times, because the dominance of this white on the surface of the dark reddish-brown brick uh, makes a kind of two layers the the surface, which usually portrays the character of a building like it does on this church over here, built more traditionally, I suppose, but so much has been excised from this. It kind of belies the the question Le Corbusier was asking about the integrity of the wall supporting uh, that surface. But I thought how wonderful it would be if I could not build a glass box as my building had to be twenty four stories to accommodate the the square footage and there was a 1955 building, like I suppose like the recladding of the Lever House. Uh, the cladding had gone to pot, and so they, were, they took it off, and we put a new core in this building and reclad it. And there are our big windows. There was the shape of, the, of not the existing building, but the block of the existing building is here. The core moves down the center of the building, which we replaced, the two halves of the building on either side of the core. And here's that big red block building then uh, interrupted by a surface of windows, but a win windows that have their own character relative to that surface. They are not trying to be one or a reflective glass box. So always another way to skin the cat. Here's our site uh, here, uh, and this is Caesar's corner, which is there, and here's his building with this kind of cabbage on the top. Um, and that's Rob Creer's building right here his first tall building. Uh, and then very, very manageable, low-scale housing uh, around uh, Rob's plan with retail always at the base. This is a building by KPF, which 
will stand on that site, and you see the site's been cleared, but they haven't started the building, and there's some question now, but I, I don't know what the status of that is. I don't mean to imply anything. Um, for the ICF, the International Finance Corporation of the World Bank on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, we're building a building that's 580 feet long. It's a million square feet. Again, a building that's much too big. Um, but it was hard to say no. Um, so uh, here is Pennsylvania Avenue, and this is 20th and 21st. Really ought to be 20th, 21st, and 22nd because of the length of this block. But this is the standard 110 feet in, in Washington. Uh, but given the length of this and that, again, it was standard offices from one end to the other with, with uh, special meeting rooms at the, at the ends, um, what I've done is I convinced them that if we built corner, more corner offices, they would have a way of distributing the hierarchy of people inside the World Bank, and there certainly is a hierarchy. So looking again at this Miranding etching, where things are more or less similar to each other, I have made that kind of distribution across the face of the thing, not really pavilions, that, but these kind of huge townhouses, if, as it were, 110 feet high, which is about a 10-story New York building. Uh, all along that face, a way to break it up. At the same time, uh, do something to the offices inside. In Miami, I think I'll have to fly. Um, no, it's getting late. I've lost my voice, and you've lost your patience. Um, but in Miami, um, I'm really taking lots of heat for this one. Uh, but this is the end of the Deco District here. This is 15th and Ocean. The real ocean is over here. This is Ocean Drive there, one of the last deco buildings there at the intersection. Our site is at the sort of cusp of the change of zoning uh, where Morris Lapidus and all those 50s buildings are up north of us, uh, perpendicular to the water, which is this way in this site model here. What we're doing um, is, is to make up uh, this model isn't up to date. But there's a plaza here, retail. You can't have enough gaps. Uh, and then an office building out of this old uh, uh, single f uh, uh, family occupancy over there on this side. Uh, and then our tower, which is here, which has, again, uh, three kinds of, of, of apartments. This center piece, which is the major piece, and then the rotunda at the end which is here, looks out to the water, gets great views to the Atlantic. And then another pair of towers here on the back side, uh, here and here, that look back to the city and Coral Gables and so on. My, my apartment is in that tower right there. It's a condominium which has just broken ground. Uh, a building I'm very proud of, but it turns out the magazines don't like very much. Um, but I think it's one of my best, is the, is the Denver Library. Um, yet another competition, which we won. Uh, we don't win them all, um, I'm sorry to say, but this one I was happy to win because I liked our building. But um, Bob Stern was also in this competition. He did an extraordinarily good building. Um, that's hard for me to say, but I, I, I say it anyway. Um, but it, I think it was one of his best, and it's too bad. Of course, competitions do that to people. Uh, you know, you, you try and you, and you compete very hard, but for one reason or another, we, we won this one. Uh, there is a skewer in our plan which connects uh, the Joponti uh, Museum built a number of years ago on the left here. This is a big civic square, uh, the county courthouse and the city hall at either end of this square, something called the Greek Theater, which is a neoclassical piece there, a hemicycle around a theater there, <clears throat> and a history museum on this side. And the idea is that these three institutions connect through our building. Big yellow school bus arrives here, the kids pile out, see how to, what goes on in the museum, and then come across to the library, see how to use all of the stuff there and have lunch, and then they go to the History Museum on the other side. So these two, this tower on this side and this tower on this side, the special rooms and some of the offices with an existing building, which is here, uh, 125,000 square feet, 1955, 
sitting right there, which is protected um, in town, a rather nice little modernist piece uh, looking out to uh, the Civic Square, and you can see what uh, Burnham Hoyt, the then architect, did with that. So our job was to not overwhelm this, given that we were building a building four times its size. So what we've done, what I've done, is made um, uh, from this Indiana limestone side another limestone piece in the back, which you can see a part of there in our competition model, and then sandwich those two limestone pieces with uh, the stacks in between. And I lowered the scale on this side. This is about the height of the Burnham Hoyt 1955 job on the other side, which doesn't show in my drawing here. <clears throat> and then this big rotunda here, which is, are the special meet, uh, uh, reading rooms inside. There they are there. Uh, this is uh, January speaker there, uh, Philip Johnson. You can ask him about that and how, how snow does on that slippery top there. Um, an, another New York architect who built this refrigerator over here, very, very, very well known, sh very short name. Um, um, and, um, but we didn't want to do that, so we've exposed all of those pieces of the puzzle, the stacks behind the cores here, the arcade along here where you look in at the books, the entry on one side, the entry on the other, and so on. Um, I kind of like these, these, this kind of demure 19th century school there and this little factory over here on the side rather than, than these tall guys. But you won't say anything to Philip anyway, so you, you're well-mannered. Um, lots of questions about the top. Um, light comes in uh, and the exhaust goes out, and I thought it was appropriate to give uh, that rotunda a hat. As you will see inside, it makes more sense. The shop is in here where they sell the t-shirts and make the money for the library. Um, the foyer is here looking like the stacks in my house, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, and then you move through that into what they call the Great Hall, which is much too pompous. And obviously the photographer, I don't want any questions about people in pictures after this. I didn't take this picture. People don't pollute pictures, you know. Uh, but the scale of the, of the room ought to be intact without people, obviously. And you ought to imagine how big we are when we see a room like this, or even a, a giant room like that, which is the Western History Reading Room, which is the favorite spot in town now, I'm told, for young folks to pick each other up and do other kinds of things. <laughs> do things that they used to do at the mall. Um, <clears throat> better at the library, I guess. At the University of Cincinnati, a new <clears throat> classroom building, which is for experimental uh, laboratory work, um, and, and uh, kinds of fumes come out of the tops of these vessels, like Mirandi's vessels there that you don't want to know about. But this is a new entry to the campus, the University of Cincinnati, uh, where Peter Eisman is building new School of Architecture, and Harry Cobb is building <clears throat> a new music school, and Bob Venturi is building a new dormitory, and Frank Gehry is building something else. I don't know quite what, but it, it looks like a Frank building. Um, you know, one of these and one of those uh, that work together, I guess, for classrooms and faculty offices and so on. But <clears throat> taking some of what I've said tonight, but expanding on it quite a bit, I guess. Our plan shows laboratories in the center, again, saddlebags on the outside, which are the, the faculty offices uh, here and then the postdoc offices on either side that feed the laboratories. Now, this site is wonderful in that you start out here at ground level and emerge 17 feet in the air on the back side, so you take a long stair inside our building, uh, get up to what they call Library Square behind. The dean of the, of the school, when we started, that, started this, asked us to hide as much of this 70s job here as we possibly could. Um, the University of Cincinnati, when I went there, was about 3,000 people, and now it's uh, 35,000 people at the state university, and it built at the, the wrongest time in the history of mankind, of course, the 60s and 70s, as many campuses did. Uh, there's our new building hiding the old one. Maybe some of you don't think it's an improvement, 
um, that there is, uh, the, are the labs and these are the offices, a pretty simple plan. Here's our pass through, which we'll see from the front door there in the finished building. There's our model connection back to the 70s job here. And there is the finished building with the vents at the top, which will, I promise you, turn green rather rapidly, given what I know is coming out of the top of all of that. It won't take uratic acid to turn that copper. And here it is from the stadium and the power plant, which I kind of like in this kind of rugged building uh, behind it, and the passage up through to Library Square behind our laboratory. <clears throat> At Emory University, I, I, I've got to go faster. Emory University, we built, uh, we, we renovated a building that was built in 1915 by Henry Hornbostel, a wonderful Pittsburgh architect at the turn of the century, who designed all of this quadrangle, but not all of the buildings on the quadrangle. There was a kind of broken tooth, as there is on this side over here. And eight years later, I was asked to build uh, another part of the museum. We renovated the law school. Of course, the lawyers had moved out long ago as they'd gotten much, much bigger. Um, but but uh, this is art and archaeology, and this was their classrooms. And then they received lots of dough for new collections from a private donor, and they built a new building. Across the quadrangle is a ramp that starts up to a Paul Rudolph um, chapel of a number of years ago, 15 or 20 years ago. Some of you might remember it. So this, this tooth will never be uh, f uh, filled in. Uh, but but uh, we built that, and here is our building with stairs that go up on either side that take you up to the third floor where there are uh, activities that look out over a ravine on the backside, a, um, a, a lunch room and cappuccino room and so on for the faculty and students to meet. So, so the idea is people move up here and here. They don't, it doesn't show very well in that slide. Front door is there. Passage down to the ravine on that side and connection back to the other building. Uh, there's the big meeting room up there. And then into the foyer on the right-hand side, just inside this door, uh, you take a kind of chronological yellow brick road through the whole thing, and the architecture starts to uh, use the, the scale of the endeavor of, of the collection, as well as like Hornbostel did at, at uh, Carnegie Mellon, then called Carnegie Tech, in the School of Architecture there that he built in Pittsburgh. Uh, he embedded in the floor the the uh, in black and white marbles, the plan, plans of the great buildings of the Western world. So what we've done at a different time and a different budget is stenciled on the plans of, in that case, the Acropolis in the Greek collection and Ramses II over here uh, to give kind of didactic position in the, in the floors. As you walk through it, all those floors are done in that manner. A site plan uh, for Camden, New Jersey, this is the river and Philadelphia on the other side. Uh, out of all of this planning, uh, we were given that little dot right there. Um, but that's what you get. Um, and this is a, a parking garage here that was built a few years ago. Luckily, they haven't continued it. The idea of the planner then was to have a series of office buildings that would simply surround it. And given the looks of the parking garage, it would be a good idea to surround it with almost anything. And so our building is there at the first corner. We've been asked to do a twin tower looking back to Philadelphia for the Port Authority of New Jersey and Pennsylvania. There's my sketches for the front door of Camden looking back at Philadelphia right off the Walt Whitman Bridge. And this is really a standard office building just being completed now. <clears throat> Here are yellow columns again, and our meeting rooms up there, and then uh, two floors of offices within each one of these uh, openings, and then a uh, colonnade at the base that stretches across the ugly parking garage. In Pittsburgh, uh, a new office, speculative office building, which, like the Museum of Modern Art, will help pay for the, the Civic Theater to the left here which we'll also get to plan, but one will not be built without the other, uh, uh, though we are starting the detailed planning of the, of the, I think that was to say that we're finished with the lecture. Um, anyway, never mind. Uh, this is um, in Cincinnati. Uh, it appears that we might get to do a new Bengal stadium here, 
which is over there on, if they don't go to Cleveland, uh, and, and if Cleveland doesn't go to, to um, Baltimore or wherever, uh, and the musical chairs of sports franchises and all built around expensive skyboxes. Uh, and this is a new red stadium there. Uh, Cincinnati tore down Crosley Field about 20 years ago and built uh, a multi-purpose uh, stadium for football and, and baseball. After 20 years, they're tearing it down. You know, it, it just was appalling to me. Um, and so we will now have a football stadium and a baseball stadium. They look something like this. The scale's not very good yet. Um, but um, this is Johnny Bench Park right here in front, um, which connects back to this plinth, which we will get to keep from the old stadium back to the Bengals uh, Stadium there on the right, where people will park for both facilities. Oh, well. Uh, at, of all things, a spec house in Germany, uh, a place called Meyerbusch. Have you all been there? Um, all the pieces here, this is called Villa Gables, have been called out uh, into, finally you see where the, the Winkies live. The kids are here, uh, and the nannies and so on, and then the garage tacked on the back uh, with, um, with uh, uh, a kind of uh, lattice around it in the living room and, and uh, terrace for the master bedroom there on the right in the rotunda. <clears throat> Another house, we're almost at the end, a house just north of Boston looking out to the ocean. This, the ocean is up here at the top. My light's fading. That ought to tell you something. Um, and then the, the real house is here in the center. Um, it's easier to, I guess, point. Uh, but the, the, the client invents software, and he does that with his wife over here. She's a painter. Uh, the garage is there, and then the kids live in that arm along the side with the kitchen and the food. And um, then this is a lap pool uh, that is now kind of slung under the house as, as they decided they didn't. They first asked for that so they could build it later, then they decided they had to have it now, which meant it became the foundation for the house, but it's still okay. Um, these are the early sketches for that. There's the, the lap pool on this side, and you can make it out with that long colonnade there, letting light into the pool on this side. This is not the diving board outside. Uh, but this, this is his office there. I guess it pays to make software. Oh, Bill Gates is talking tonight, isn't he? So here's the Oceanside model and drawing. And this is another oceanfront house. I'm not allowed to use their name, but he's chairman of Warner Brothers. Um, and this is his house at Malibu, their house at Malibu. Um, these are early drawings here. He wanted a glass, uh, two-story glass house. And I said no, and I couldn't believe I said that because I thought he'd say get lost. Uh, but but given that Meyer built right, Richard built right down the beach, and so did Guathme, and he didn't like their houses. And Frank Gehry built just up the beach, Carbon Beach, and he didn't want that, so he was stuck with me. And and they all have to be different. But these are really wonderful people, great clients. And I I talked him out of a glass facade, but gave him his glass back but said, since that's west, we do have to protect all of this. And luckily, I got to have the porch here on the bedroom wing up at the top, or bedroom level, and living room and dining room are down at the lower level, as you see in the drawing there, or the photograph there on the right. This building is now all green, covered with bougainvillea and, and trumpet vine. It's the screening room where all of these cats, not Katzenberg, who's in the Guathme house, uh, all trade each other's films over the weekend and have parties and live this kind of life that is portrayed in these houses. Um, but th that room is really rather well proportioned on the right. It just is the lens that this photographer used that made it look like the Bahnhof again. Um, I never understood that. I mean, if rooms are proportion that lens shouldn't make them look twice as long. But I do like, I use this slide because I like the light that streaks across the floor and that's very much the, what it does do. And it's, 
<laughs> and it's not in your eyes up at the upper level. And they were so interested in having it open, open, open that from the front door he wanted to open the front door and sort of give it all away. No foreplay whatsoever in this house. Um, and therefore the table had to be glass and thin. So it gave me another opportunity to do something that I wouldn't normally do, like the clunky furniture there on the, on the left, which is ours. Upstairs, um, outside these doors there, you get that view, which isn't bad for beginners. Um, and they write their thank you notes here. Uh, and, and I think there are a lot to do. And so we'll finish with my house, which is a, always a work in progress. I bought a, an, an abandoned warehouse, which people stored soggy books in. Um, in the 20s and 30s, and it had been abandoned for about 10 years. No plumbing, heating, electricity uh, um, in this shell of a building that was built by Italian masons who came to Princeton in the 20s, middle 20s, to build Gothic dormitories. They were imported from Tuscany. Uh, the, the masons were with their families, and they built these wonderful buildings for the campus. But at the same time, they moonlighted this warehouse for a friend of theirs who just ran this this warehouse in the middle of a residential zone would never be allowed today, but I thought it was a great find and very cheap. Uh, I didn't know in 1969 or 70, whenever it was, how expensive it would be to put a bathroom in a building like this and then heating and lighting and, and take away a mound of, of rubbish that was easily that big in this, what I fondly call the garden. Uh, which was clearly uh, the backyards to all of these houses that surrounded this. This you can't see from the, high, the, from the street, luckily. Uh, um, but uh, clearing it all away, and this is now 20-some years in the, in the making. But I'll show you what, in my little Maison Domino, what was fixed. The, certainly the floors were fixed, and, and uh, I could take away some of the ceilings, and there's a skylight above that. And the, and the uh, uh, the pergola and the and and wisteria coming in there turned white last year. Somebody said I didn't have enough iron in the soil. It wasn't purple anymore. So if that's true, um, then I'm going to plant nails around it next next year. But but the white was very pretty. Uh, this is the living room or sitting room, which is awfully small. It doesn't look so small here. It's really quite comfortable. But the way this house is used is for gatherings of the university and, and my class and, and, um, and for, for uh, conversations with larger groups than just a family, as, as I'm the only family now that everybody's grown up and left. She left, too. Um, um, <laughs> It wasn't because there was too much Biedemeyer, and, uh, too, presumably too little of me as I worked too much. But, uh, but the ceilings were fixed, and then uh, that meant that the new mechanical systems, given there was no basement, I didn't realize what a liability that was uh, in 1969. Uh, but I brought the mechanical services around the top of all of that. There's the dining room, again, rather low ceilings. Um, could be opened up a bit. My real ambition, as I bought another piece of property adjacent to this, is build a big room for large gatherings and let this be a, a part of the library, which is just here to the side, as you'll see in a second. And we're almost finished. Uh, there's a little solarium uh, that looks out into a little garden on the side, which didn't have any trash in it, uh, filled with light. This is a kind of morning room. It gets wonderful light. Uh, for breakfast. Cheerios have never tasted so good. Uh, the library is here, a structural problem there. I only had eight feet to work with from one side to the other. The shelves were about 18 to 20 inches apiece, and so there wasn't much room left uh, if you were to make this um, a part of the library. Could have been a porch, could have been a lot of things, but it was a long, narrow room. Uh, I had opened it up. There was a stair here in the old uh, warehouse. So what I have done is to make it seem even narrower. Instead of making it properly proportioned, I narrowed it so it would seem like uh, a library stacks. And these stacks are curious. You remember the ones I showed you in, 
in Denver, the, that, this became the, the, the prototype for that, in that this is like a you know, street of buildings, and the buildings that are contained here are obviously the texts that were on, are on those shelves. And then on those shelves as well are the, some of the grand tour objects that I collect, which in this case are the Temple of Vesta, those little ink wells which have kind of pragmatic use as well as the reminder of the architecture that surrounds this uh, room where I get, get my book and take it into the living room and sit and read and so on when there's time. Um, but bringing something back from Europe uh, in the 19th century, people brought back these little bronze and marble figures instead of plastic statue of liberty they brought back these but the in inclination was exactly the same um, and many of the objects i collect are now grand tour objects but i show you uh, to conclude these landscape both in sculpture and um, this uh, little picture out of focus picture here on the left of these kind of droppings or doo-doos in the park um, which uh, compose around the space that that uh, that they try to combine with, uh, so that the the land is not residual, but there is a, a, a kind of, of of sense of free uh, space in in this kind of rural landscape, and then as you bring them in, as I have in that piece of sculpture on the right, uh, one starts to think back to the beginning of this talk with the with the uh, Pierre Ligorio and how those kinds of solids are used. And com in conclusion, I show you two pictures from the same year, one by Matisse uh, and one by Le Corbusier, um, both tables, both uh, still lives. Um, they say similar things and, and dissimilar things. Both are about vanitas, about sustenance, about the plenty of life as as it's clear in, in Matisse's picture, you knew that was Matisse. Then the wine glass over here, not yet filled, um, on the left-hand side, and we saw what he did with that in his purest state. Um, his uh, pipe, which is here, which is kind of recreation, and sinister recreation as he paints it black. Um, and then the open book, and if for any anything, Le Corbusier wanted us to be scholars as well as architects, as well as musicians or whatever. He wanted us to know our craft, to know the history of our, 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 our endeavor. Um, and then uh, I find quite wonderful the, the black dice or die uh, there at the corner. I suppose if de Chirico had painted that, the literal white spots would have been painted on the black reversal uh, here. But again, the idea of chance uh, the way the, the mouse and the bread and all of that uh, with, with those same inclinations, whether Le Corbusier in his scholarship and the reading that he did knew uh, the full meanings of some of the still lives that he painted, I'm not quite sure. Uh, but I love the idea of this distribution of objects of daily life that take on a meaning in um, a, a non-liturgical society. Thank you very, very much. Well, you make a lot of pleasant noise for very few people. I'm very happy. Um, you all probably want to go. Uh, it's Monday night in New York, and there are probably thousands of things to do. Um, but if anybody has a question, I'd be happy to answer it. Yes. I wish I could. I haven't started. Uh, there was a, a scheme made by our, uh, our associated architects, um, and then we were brought in to work on the design. Um, those architects happened to be still very much in favor um, by the clients, uh, but they had simply done a kind of uh, footprint of the building and uh, the size of the building, which is not overwhelming, not like some of these projects that I showed tonight. But um, I think what I would love to do is make a place where I would like to rent an apartment. Um, so I'll make it as good as I can because I'd love to be a, 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 a I'd love to occupy one of the places there. I understand that you might live nearby. 
well, that's, that's good. Um, uh, come to community board and help. Uh, we'll all try to make it as good as we can. But, you know, I, I don't get to work here very much. Not many of my friends do. I don't know why. Um, but um, I've only done one little facade in town, so... Um, um, it, uh, you saw what the inclinations are, um, and the, I think on the whole, they're good and contextual and all those good things. But, but um, um, what the restrictions will be on that building, I'm not quite sure yet. But we're just getting into it, so uh, I can't wait. Actually, what he's talking about is a little apartment building that we're doing on 79th Street, where an auction house stands today. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.